Uh, so Greg's going to tell us about how to deal with salt conditions in realistic simulations. Thanks very much, Jay. Uh, so as he mentioned, this work was carried out with John Cadera at Memorial Sloan Kettering. I'm now at Schrodinger. So I'm talking about salt. And when we look at salt in the body, we find that there's very different concentrations depending on where you look. So in the intercellular fluid, uh, the salt concentration is dominated by sodium chloride. But when we look inside the cell, the potassium ions dominate and uh, acids and proteins dominate the negative charges. And even inside organelles as well, there's a, there's a great var variety of uh, salt concentrations. So in the nuclear plasm, there's way more electrolytes, so lots more uh, sodium and lots more potassium, for instance. And malignancy also can change uh, salt conditions. So uh, tumours are well known to alter pH, but they also alter the ion concentrations. So uh, in tumours, <coughs> if you look at the extracellular fluid around tumours, there's an enrichment of potassium ions. And this is because necrosis uh, causes cells to spew out their inter intracellular potassium to the extracellular fluid. <coughs> and this has an effect that it actually suppress suppresses uh, the immune response. And this plot shows, it's from this paper from in 2016, showing that in mouse and hum uh, human tumours, the potassium concentrations are greatly elevated with respect to serum levels. <coughs> It should go without saying, but ions also greatly influence biomolecular behavior. So in addition to uh, ion channels, which are an obvious example, they are also known to affect things like protein folding and so, uh, solubility, the affinity of ligand DNA complexes, the affinity of host guest complexes, and the affinity of small molecules and proteins. But when we do fringe calculations or molecular dynamic simulations, we sometimes only do neutralizing counter ions, or some fixed amount of salt, typically sodium chloride. And the fact that it's fixed is interesting because when we look at the local environment of a protein or biomolecule, the number of ions within a local region is constantly fluctuating. So if you imagine that this test tube is some macroscopic system, it kind of is, uh, within this test tube, the amount of salt is fixed. But in any local region around a protein, the number of ions is constantly increasing or decreasing. And it's fluctuating a lot. But we don't really know how much it's fluctuating by. Also, depending on the properties of the protein and how it interacts with ions, it may draw in more positive ions than one would expect uh, based on the macroscopic salt concentration or, or fewer. So with this in mind, uh, we have some motivating questions that we wanted to address with simulations. First off, what's the mean salt concentration around a typical biomolecule? Secondly, what is the degree of fluctuation of salt around a biomolecule? Uh, and thirdly, to what extent are binding for energies dependent on the mean salt concentration? To what extent are they dependent on the variance of the salt concentration? And perhaps more practically, how much should we add uh, when we're doing molecular dynamic simulations or fringe calculations? And it's probably worth saying that di different simulation packages have a totally different way of dealing with salt. So what is the best? If we, if we could know the answer, what's the best way to add salt? So we tackled this problem using semi-grand canonical Monte Carlo. Now, you could also tackle this problem by um, simulating explicitly uh, the volume we're interested in and explicitly simulating the reservoir. So we could do molecular dynamic simulations of a huge system that exchanges ions between the reservoir and the system of interest. But in GCMC, Grand Canonical Monte Carlo, we take the limit of the, this reservoir becoming infinitely large so that the number of uh, salt pairs and water molecules tends to infinity, but the ratio of them stays constant. And this mathematical trick allows us to replace explicitly simulating the saline <coughs> reservoir in this case with just the system of interest and uh, the methodology allows us to create and annihilate uh, ions within that. And uh, I'll refer to any device that's able to maintain a constant macroscopic salt concentration, but a fluctuating variable amount of ions around a biomolecule and osmostat. So um, we wrote uh, an open source package called SaltSwap, which is available on GitHub under the in the Kudera Lab GitHub account. 
And uh, I use Young and Cheatham parameters, and we only consider sodium chloride for this package. We do have a paper out. It's, uh, it's in the bio archive, and it's going to be shortly coming out in JFIS can be. So the way that the method works is by exchanging uh, salt ions with water molecules. So it's called a semi-grand canonical Monte Carlo because the total number of molecules in the system is constant, such that when we insert and delete an ion, we're also we're exchanging that with water. So total uh, constant number of particles. And the fact that we have this variable, uh, variable number of water molecules means that we have to replace, we have to have a new uh, simulation parameter, and that is this chemical potential difference, which is the difference between two water molecules and sodium chloride. And the reason why it's two water molecules is because we're exchanging two water molecules for every sodium chloride. And I should also say that uh, all these transformations are electrostatically neutral. Now, the important thing to remember with the chemical potential, the chemical potential difference here, is that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the salt concentration in the reservoir, which we're not simulating, and the chemical potential that we're using in the simulation. So the chemical potential here is actually a property of the reservoir. And if we, yeah, so if we have a salt concentration in the reservoir that we'd like to reproduce in our simulation, we need to have the right delta mu. And a bit more mathematical detail, uh, this is the probability density that we're sampling from in the salt swap package. So it's dependent on, say, the total energy of the system, which depends on the configuration x. Uh, we do have a barostat, so that's the pressure and volume. And you can see here, this is the extra semi-grand canonical Monte Carlo term. And uh, I define the number of salt pairs in the system as the minimum between sodium and chloride. So basically, it's the, it's the number of neutralizing pairs in the system. Okay, so how do we insert and delete ions? So the, the problem with in doing an instantaneous insertion and deletion is that it's probably going to be rejected. And so instead, we use non-equilibrium candidate Monte Carlo to gradually anneal in the changes to the system. So the way it works is that imagine we've got uh, two water molecules, both with their non-bonded parameters, their partial charges and van der Waals parameters. Over a non-equilibrium trajectory, we gradually permute these to the non-bonded parameters of ions, such that in the end state, we have two ions. And in the process, we've allowed the system to relax around these changes. And the, the trial moves are accepted or rejected based on the non-equilibrium work of this process. And in our hands, we didn't try to optimize it too much, but we found that non-equilibrium candidate Monte Carlo really accelerated the, uh, the sampling. So if you do instantaneous insertions and deletions, the probability to accept something is like 10 to the minus 50. But with NCMC, you can get sort of 30% or 15% depending on the water model. And this shows that as you increase the length of the uh, non-equilibrium process, there's a monotonic relationship between the uh, acceptance probability and the length of the protocol. And for the reason why tip 4 p seems a bit lower is that I'm not sure, but there, there must be a, a a lower phase space overlap with the ions in TIP4P. <coughs> and if you look at the efficiency of the simulation as well, defined by, say, the average probability to accept over the total compute time, there's a massive boost in efficiency to something like to the 10 to the power of 50. So NCMC is crucial to being able to sample, sample sort concentrations. And I can't go into too much detail on how we calibrated the uh, osmostats. But as I mentioned, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the chemical potential and the concentration of the reservoir. And the mapping depends on the free energy. So this is the equation we use to map chemical potential to concentration in the reservoir. And you can see that it's dependent on, if you can, uh, it's a big equation, but it's, it's this F free energy here is the free energy to swap two water molecules. And this V is the average volume in the system. So to calibrate the chemical potential, we have to calculate these for a number of different salt pairs. The basic workflow goes like this. We do uh, self-adjusted mixture sampling and to, to calculate uh, different salt concentrations for a range of uh, different parameters. And we calculate the free energy to insert or delete salt based on the non-equilibrium work. And based on these, on the curve, we, the resultant curve, we can say, oh, I want to simulate a 200 millimolar. And you just read off the chemical potential you want. And then you've got yourself an osmostat when you apply it to simulation.
So when applied to uh, a protein, DHFR, this, you can see that uh, the salt concentration fluctuates over time, and these are different macroscopic salt concentrations, and that the autocorrelation time is on the <coughs> order of, say, a nanosecond. So if you want roughly tens of independent samples, you need to run for tens of nanoseconds. So returning to the motivating questions of uh, how much salt uh, do we expect to see um, biomolecules and, and what's the best scheme to add salt, we applied the Osmostat on DHFR, SART kinase, and a Drew Dickinson DNA dodecoma. And uh, the plots I'm about to show define the local salt concentration as the number of salt pairs over the total volume. And uh, current methods to add salt in fixed salt MD, you can either add salt say, based on the total simulation volume, such as in Gromax, the volume of the solvent, such as in Chamgui, or the ratio of water molecules to salt pairs, such as in OpenML. And this is always after neutralizing counterions have been added. So without further ado, this is what realistic biomolecule salt fluctuations look like. Uh, in a box of water, we can see that the fluctuation is actually very large. So this is for a 200 millimolar osmostat. So the fluctuation goes from, say, 100 millimolar to 300 millimolar, and the all schemes are quite good at reproducing the salt concentration. With DHFR, uh, the only one that seems to do quite well is the ratio, based on the ratio, and again, the degree of fluctuation is very large. Sarkinase, the fluctuation is much shorter because the number of water molecules is larger, but with the DNA dodecoma, which has a charge of, total charge of minus 22, all methods are not do not capture the actual mean salt concentration very well, and the variance is much, much larger. And that's because uh, there's an awful lot of neutralizing counterions in the DNA dodecoma system, and that has an effective salt concentration on its own, so that, that acts to repel uh, other ions. And in the process of writing this up, um, Jeremy Smith got in contact with John and I and, and gave us uh, let us know about his paper that he released, and that had a, a mean field approach to predicting the local salt concentrations in uh, bio biomolecular systems. And you can see that it does okay at all these systems, but does a much better job at reproducing the mean in the DNA system. So I can see I'm out of time. So I think I should uh, wrap it up. And, uh, but that, that's the main conclusion, basically. So. I don't have time to go into anything more, but I'd just like to thank those at MSK, uh, particularly John Cadera and, and Bas, who, who helped a lot. And I would have talked a little bit about water and the sampling of water in GCMC and uh, further extensions, but with that, I'd like to thank uh, Lingler as well, particularly. So thank you. <laughs> Any questions for Greg? I haven't actually. So, at this, uh, that's a great question. And I, at this stage, it's more like it's getting the infrastructure available to ask those kinds of questions. Uh, so I don't know, uh, but I would love to see. And uh, I'd also like to see what effect it really has on binding fringes as well. So that's that's really those kinds of questions are the next steps of this thing. Could you translate the? 100 to 300 millimolar to actually the number of ions you're talking about in the context of the, I think probably 25. No, I've forgotten how small those boxes are. Yeah, I, I can't tell you exactly, but it's it's a small number. So I mean, um, no more. Well, in in a system containing maybe say 5,000 water molecules, it's going to be like five um, sodium chloride pairs, something like that. It's I think it's pretty small because it's millimolar. Yeah, it's a, it's a handful of ions. Can you comment on the time scales involved in terms of acceleration of the ion atmosphere, especially with respect to what might be a, a charge changing perturbation? What can, what can folks sort of expect in terms of that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we, in terms of, yeah, okay. So there's, there's two ways to answer that question. Uh, one way, a direct way, is saying, uh, how long do I need to propagate the dynamics of the system? 
such that they appear relaxed. And the NCMC, this non-equilibrium candidate in Monte Carlo, is kind of approaching that. Um, so it's something like, so a, a high acceptance rate basically means there's a good overlap between, uh, that you, you've allowed the system to relax enough around, say, <coughs> a, new, a new ion. And that's something like 20 femtoseconds. But that's probably too short. Uh, so that's, that's the first answer. The second answer is specifically looking at the um, autocorrelation time of interactions around uh, a biomolecule. So this is looking at different autocorrelation times for the DNA do dodecamer. And the green, there's a lot of different lines here, but the green line here is uh, the autocorrelation time for a fixed uh, salt simulation. And so you can see that after around three nanoseconds, uh, there's no autocorrelation. So, but with the, using the awesome stat uh, insertion and deletion, the autocorrelation time is much, much less. Um, so I think it depends on precisely what, like, uh, Time scale looking at. Does that does that address your question? It's a start for sure. Okay, good. Okay, let's thank Greg.